Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good evening, Abuna. How is everybody doing? Doing well. You're almost done. Can you believe that? You're almost done. At least with this week. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, that's awesome. Uh, Danielle. I'm Hello, so Danielle. I know this, this is like, I know I was last week, but I wasn't able to make it because it was conflicted with um, youth ministry. But I just wanted to come on for a minute and just get to say hi. Hi oh. to you, um, Danielle. I I Danielle, uh, uh, nobody knows what's going on between you and I. Nobody. Oh yes. Have any idea what's happening? Danielle and her parents were my parishioner while her father was uh, at Leavenworth, uh, Fort Leavenworth, uh, doing his studies, and I, th I think he was a major then. Is he still in the military? Oh, awesome. Awesome. Where are they? Where are they? They're, um, they're downstairs. <laughs> oh, well, please call them right up. Now. Call them up. Tell them Father Elias one wants to oh. say hello. Can you do that? Sure, sure. I can I'd, go let them I'd love, know. You look a lot like back. your mother. You look like so much like your mother. Uh, so oh. if, if you would be kind, bring them up uh, and, and, and let's, okay. let everybody meet them, if hey, you don't mind. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, the story about them. They no, were, I don't. They were in Kansas City and Danielle was four years old. And uh, she was a cute little girl. She still is. Um uh, <laughs> And this year when I was appointed, this summer when I was appointed, early summer, was appointed to be the director of the residency, she wrote me and she told me about her, about herself, and I was really amazed. Uh, uh, it shows how old I am now. <laughs> amazing, amazing old, yes, yes. And I'm so blessed to see somebody that was part of the early life of the parish we started my parish in as a mission in 2002 and um uh, and uh, um we've been at it ever since and this is how we met uh, the duvall's family and um uh, he was a major in the military and uh and they had they had a daughter a four-year-old daughter and um here she is at the uh, Antiochian House study. Can you believe that? Great story. Amazing. Hopefully she, uh, they come back on uh, soon. I hope I didn't, uh, she, well, I think she's still there, so, okay. Well, that's good. Uh, some of you were here last Tuesday, so obviously you either liked it or you enjoyed the punishment. So <laughs> <laughs> whichever comes first anyway. Today, I think uh, Deacon uh, uh, Simeon uh, Spencer will join us. Uh, oh, cool. I expect him to be there any minute. He's the, uh, uh, the TA and uh, a PhD student and uh, a candidate for finishing up his stuff. So um, love to have him uh, be part of this and help us engage and have a nice uh, dialogue and entertaining and allow all of us to get to know each other and for you to get to know each other and all, all the good stuff. So anyway, uh, Mark, uh, are you a, a deacon or a priest? Forgive me, I never got that uh, answer. Um, <clears throat> I'm a priest in the continuing Anglican movement. Oh, I see. Okay. You have never you have not converted into uh, orthodoxy yet? Is that what? Uh... Yeah, we're in the process right now. Okay, okay, all right. Just wanna make sure to address you the right way if you're 
it's if you've uh, been a reordained priest, then, then that's a different uh, thing. So uh, may God bless that journey and 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 be with you. And uh, um, we're very sympathetic and and uh, looking forward to welcome you. Thank you. And and all for uh, two feet and hands and heart and your whole being. So. Okay. Uh, May God be merciful to all of us. Uh, Danielle, so how is, how is your classes going? Um, they're, they're going well so far, I think. I was kind of overwhelming all the information, but I'm trying to do my reading and everything. So, but it's interesting. Good. Are, are mom and dad going to come up and join us? Are they going to come and, and say hello? Oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Good to see you, too. Oh, where are you now? In Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Oh, so, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You need to come back so and, after, and visit and see St. Basil. After we left. I've seen it online. We'd like to. Yes. Yeah, I would love to see you. We'd love to have you come back and. And it comes and spend a, a bit of vacation with us. Okay. All right. Uh, you still serving in the army? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's good. How long? No, I retired. I, I, I retired in 2016, in July of 2016, and now I work as a contractor for the. For oh, the I see. At Fort I Knox. See. Yeah, oh, at Fort Knox. Fort Knox. It's good. It's good. So, so glad to have you. So glad to see you. I, I still remember you yeah. the, on, on your last <laughs> week, on your last week when you came to my house yeah. and we, we had a, a going away uh, right. lunch or dinner, whatever, whatever we, uh, yeah, you could right. call it then. Oh, yeah, you treated yeah. it very, yeah, it was beautiful. We felt very, very included and um, it was a very special time for us. Thank you. That's wonderful. So I'm, I'm glad to have We're glad uh, Danielle yeah, thank as you. part of this. She's, I'm glad to see uh, your daughter, Danielle. I was so sh surprised when she wrote me, uh, sent me an email, let me know. I said, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I thought, <laughs> I, I put my hands on my head. I said, oh my goodness. Uh, glory to God, though. I'm glad to see you here. <laughs> glad to see you. Nice to, uh, nice to see you both yeah. and look forward to the time when you both uh, can you. can come and revisit thank you Deacon Simeon thank glad to have you thank you this is the uh, the Simeon thank you. this is the Simeon and the Isa show so <laughs> <laughs> and the what <laughs> the Isa show Isa show not the ice Isa oh okay. yeah the Isa show yes <laughs> yes <laughs> okay Yes, so, well, I always feel good when I'm in the presence of my beloved father Elias. So we're we're uh, we're great colleagues and friends. And so uh, last uh, last Tuesday we had uh, a Kiriaki with us, and uh, yeah. everybody shared their spiritual journey. Yeah, uh, with everybody, everybody that was la uh, here Tuesday is joining us today with the addition of Danielle. My, uh, my little girl of many years, yeah, many that, years is she, ago. Is she in your parish? Is she in your parish? She was in my, in my parish uh, years ago when she was yeah. four years old. And now oh, okay. uh, she is uh, part of my world at uh, the Antiochian House of Study. So oh, glory to God. God. Well, to God. Danielle, can you stay with us? Uh, how long can you stay with us here on, on the show? <laughs> um well <laughs> i mean you, i don't mind saying i wasn't planning on because i know it's for the for it's the second week so i know i really should have been here last week so i don't want to like no no um, that's okay anyone could could come in and join in uh one of the things we've been wanting to do is just maybe do it once a month well we have an event like this one a show like this one um and uh everybody could uh, log in and and uh, get to know each other and, and talk about different things related to school. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll have surprises. It'll, it'll be probably uh, um, managed by uh, 
a uh, um, teacher assistant, and perhaps we'll have some guest speakers, or not, not necessarily speakers, some guests on the show, and uh, a surprise guest. And uh, you get to meet some new, uh, new person personalities inv involved in the life of the uh, uh, of the school, and and perhaps professors and some other ones as well. Okay, but if you if you could be, you're welcome to stay with us the whole time. That would be wonderful. Yeah, if you're not, you, know, you could cut out any time you want. Really, you just have to tell us your most embarrassing moment, and then that's the the that you you can get out of here. So yeah. Go for it. That's it. That's the the starting question, Deacon. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> well, that's funny. Yeah, I probably can't stay too long for this one because I actually we haven't I... eaten dinner yet. But <laughs> I guess I do have an embarrassing moment I can share. Is that really the question? <laughs> I just made that up, but I would we would all love to hear your most embarrassing embarrassing moment. Okay. Well, um, it was a couple of years ago when it, um, I was at the, um, in college, I was there at the cafeteria and I was eating before a test. And then I took a sip of coffee and I don't even know what happened. I, I, it started going down the wrong way, I think. And I coughed and I spit coffee out all over the table and over my papers and everything. It was pretty bad. Nobody, people pretended like they didn't see it, but that, that was really, really, that was pretty bad. So, yeah. yeah we feel like we know you better because we, we all have even more embarrassing moments than that. So if that's your most embarrassing moments, you've lived a good charmed life. So thank you. Well, David. I don't know. I'm sure I, I have one. Deacon, do you have one? <laughs> Deacon Simeon. Uh, I do, but I, I can't say it. I won't say it. So it okay. involved a cheerleader in high school <laughs> and a humiliation in class. So again, where people pretended like they didn't see uh, to see it. So, yeah. So well, any anyone that has, can answer the same question or if you if you don't, if you're not comfortable, uh, go ahead and say any interesting moment in your life. Or funny moment. I don't know about a funny moment, but I had an interesting moment. I was a hard rock miner up in Leadville, uh, Colorado, back in the very early, late seventies and early eighties. You tell us, and, and we'll define it. Okay. And so I went up to. Uh, I was working in what they call a, a stope, and we, uh, when you blow something up in underground mine, you got to uh, drill eight foot long holes and and put up like chain link fence to keep the the top of it from coming down on you. And I just remember going to, uh, uh, we had everything all done and or halfway done and had all of our bolts in place and part of the, the chain link things up, up and stuff. And we went to lunch and kind of had a funny feeling about going to lunch because we didn't usually go at that time and we went. And when we came back, all, all eight foot long bolts and the whole top of the ceiling had come down right where we were standing. So I felt very lucky and very fortunate for that. Uh, the, I think I worked there from 1978 until 82. And in that time we had like seven people died in the mine. So that was an interesting thing being a, a, going from a, uh, the Air Force to a hard rock miner to spending the last 25 years as a, a systems DBA for Children's Hospital taking care of Epic. <laughs> wow. A minor. I mean, did you like have a light on your head? Yep. And the whole self rescue thing. I worked at uh, Climax Malibu Mine until '82, and I worked uh, uh, until '84 at Swaltzwalder Uranium Mine. So I worked at a uranium mine uh, near Golden for about two years. And in '84, I decided, all right, I'll leave the Building of America to the young men that have stronger backs, and I'll go on to something where I can use my brain to make a living. And that's worked out yeah. pretty well so far. <laughs> wow, that's tremendous. Well, respect, uh, hats off, or keep hats on for minors. So, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. The reason I say hard rock is I mentioned Kentucky, you know, the coal is considered soft rock. That's why you make the delineation uh, between coal miners and uh, hard rock miners. Well, my dad was from the hog and uh, tobacco part of Kentucky. So, uh -huh. they, uh, yes, yeah, so we always went there. So, 
and the mines. I guess they had some mines out in Western Kentucky. They had a long conveyor belt that must have gone for 50 miles wow. and it would carry coal above the ground. It would just, it'd be like a, a Roman aqueduct, you know? <laughs> right. Okay, let me ask, uh, uh, well, everybody should ha answer the same question uh, that uh, Deacon Spencer asked. Uh, but I want to ask uh, Subdeacon Philip. Can you, can you say the Lord's Prayer in Korean? Uh, not Korean, but in Mandarin I can. In many, okay, oh, would, you, would you be kind? Slowly. Sure. Because if you go so fast... I want to understand it. Slowly, I may have a chance. I need to say one thing, quick thing to, to Sadiq and Philip. My, um, my stepmother or my, the woman my dad's married to is Mandarin, and she's, she's Chinese. And so it's a very wonderful and kind of interesting going back and forth trying to learn it. So, uh, oh, no, we're need, oh, there you are. Good. So anyway, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> 愿你的国降临，愿你的旨意行在地上，如同行在天上。我们日用的饮食，今日赐给我们，免我们的债，如同我们免了人的债。不叫我们遇见试探，救我们脱离凶恶。See, I understood it. Amen. Can say, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for reading that slowly. That that was that helped. So, uh, Subdeacon Philip, what is your what is your um, Relationship to China. I, I must have missed this. Uh, that yeah, was last Thursday. Last session. Um, I, I lived in China for 10 years. I went there as a Protestant missionary. And while I was there, I had a, I became burned out in ministry. And in my search for recovery, I discovered orthodoxy and was received. Uh, well, it's very complicated and Man, and mainland China to find orthodoxy, but I, I discovered that, that there was a priest in Hong Kong, which was a you know three hundred dollar round trip. So I, I went and visited him, and I was received into the church, and in, in Hong Kong. Did did uh, did it, I lived in Korea for a little while when I was a kid, and a lot of the missionaries there were were those who got booted out of China when the communists took over. Oh, okay. And so, um, uh, 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 what is it, Nelson Bell? Uh, does Hudson Taylor, uh, does Nelson Bell, do these names reverberate at all in the Christian community there at all anymore? No. No? no? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had heard of Hudson Taylor from my childhood, but not in China proper. Yeah. I, I actually started doing my morning, morning and evening prayers in, in Mandarin. I, I found... Uh, uh, I found some translations online that were a little, little bit archaic, and I, I sometimes work with a, a Chinese tutor to make them a, a bit more uh, more contemporary Chinese. Yeah, have uh, you run into this Kiriaki? No, no, uh, to uh, Cassiani. She she texted me uh, on the first day of this as the residency, and I'm I'm really excited to. Uh, co collaborate with her in any way possible. <laughs> Good. She 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 expressed interest in starting a reader's uh, reader's service in Mandarin. Of course, she lives in California and I'm in Arizona, but I absolutely love to participate through video. I I'm so sad that I there's no Chinese speaking community around me, and there's definitely not a Chinese speaking parish around me. Yeah. But I I. I I serve the Lord to the best of my capacity in a Chinese-speaking uh, environment before I became Orthodox, and I would so love to uh, complete that now that I am Orthodox. Awesome, awesome. Would, uh, can, can we have the same uh, question uh, given to everyone so we can finish that, uh, that part, and then we'll move on into different uh, questions? Well, I can take that. I cannot say the Lord's Prayer in Mandarin. <laughs> Not fast or slow. <laughs> Any embarrassing moment, uh, Subdeacon Daniel? 
Uh, the list is long and most of them inappropriate for any company at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we we want to avoid that. Exactly. So I thank yeah. God that those those times are behind me, and I look forward to uh, a better me every day. Well, how, make it funny. How about something funny? <laughs> uh, probably the look on most people's faces when I tell them the story I told uh, on Tuesday uh, about crocheting, um, and so. You know, I took up uh, crocheting about two years ago. Uh, some of the ladies from the church uh, that I attend uh, back before the days of COVID, uh, so BC, um, used to have little coffee clutches and that's, they would sit around and do it. And then they would donate anything that they had uh, crocheted to the uh, to the children's hospital. So they would crochet baby blankets, caps, gloves. And uh, one of the Popadillas had come up to me and asked me if, you know, if what I thought of that. And I said, I think that's great. I said, I probably would help me with some of my issues uh, with my, my schedule and this and that and the other. And she says, well, you got to sit down with us sometime and try it. And I'm like, I have four left hands, not even two. I have four. And, uh, she says, no, just take your time. She goes, use it as part of your prayer and make it kind of a ministry because what you're doing isn't for you. And I got to thinking about it and thought she was pretty spot on. And uh, I've probably done two dozen that I've donated to uh, the Akron Children's Hospital. And then I've uh, been making a little larger ones for uh, family, friends, and coworkers. Uh, for their newborns. So I'm actually working on one now for one of my nieces. Um, that's probably three feet by six feet in size. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? You can, David, let's, let's uh, put you on the spot. Sorry, I'm at work. That's why I'm just trying to listen in. But uh, hi, Deacon David. Uh, hello. Um, I Sub don't know. Sub Deacon David. I, I, we have two David. We have Deacon David that just came on. Welcome to uh, the Spencer and Isa show. And uh, <laughs> uh, the question uh, Deacon was asked. Uh, something funny, maybe something em embarrassing that you've done, you would like to share with uh, share on the show. So, and uh, now we ask uh, Subdeacon David, and we're gonna give him a chance. And Deacon, we'll we'll give you. You're, you'll be next. So think about something funny. Okay, Subdeacon David. Oh man, I have to think of something. I know there's things that happen all the time, but <laughs> the embarrassing moments I mostly block block out of my memory, so I don't have it to can think. Be painful about. too. We like the painful stories. So. <laughs> the pain. Doesn't have to be uh, funny, just painful. Well, I have a very interesting one that is, in some ways, funny because, well, the ending is funny. It won't seem funny at first. I was in Mexico for a mission trip twelve years ago, or so. It was a, I was in an evangelical church, and. While we were down there, our caravan of vehicles was driving along the road and a police car slammed on its brakes and blocked our path with its lights on. And then immediately following that, a dozen other police cars surrounded our four car caravan. And then four of their Humvees came out and surround <laughs> each racing with all their turrets. And then we counted 34 policemen Goodness. It, that surrounded us with all and they had uh, a combination of rifles and machine big big machine guns surrounded our whole vehicle and then uh they looked quite terrified as they <laughs> surrounded our and this is just a bunch of i was a youth leader and we had a bunch of youth high school and junior hires in the in the vehicle and uh, our translator jumped out they didn't shoot him thankfully they talked to him for a moment and then they realized that our cars only matched the description of some cartels they thought were coming through. Uh -huh. 
So they wave to us and all the places. Oh, man. <laughs> so, but it was uh, quite the eventful five minutes. Oh. But it, it turned out to be funny afterwards because none of us got uh, blown up or shot or anything. But it was a, uh, Thank God. a, a minor misunderstanding that almost went south. So. Well, International th- travel. International travel. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Deacon David, are you still there? Yes, I am. Uh, would you be kind to show us your awesome looking face and, and uh, share with us whatever, sure. whatever on your heart? Well, I was, I was thinking about uh, something maybe embarrassing and a little funny. Um, and uh, I was listening to uh, somebody who had said they were, they were knitting some things and um, this is probably maybe close to 10 years now, but uh, there was a, there was a pro, um, there was a, a thing to knit and it was called the nifty knitter. And you just loop things around these little poles and uh, depending on how you did it, you could make hats and scarves and things like this. Um, so my wife showed me one day and uh, we decided to make hats for all the, we, there was a lot of uh, uh, babies at the time in our family. So we made, I think my wife made two hats and I made like five or six of them. And um, that Christmas uh, we gave them all out and everybody was thanking my wife for doing all this knitting and, and all this kind of stuff. And then the big joke was actually, no, uh, it was me that had done all the knitting. So everybody got a kind of a kick out of that. There you go. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> so you, that was you knitting, though? You were the knitter? Yes, I was. Well, you know, my, my brother and I would fight so much. We're just a year apart. When we would go on long trips, my, my mom <clears throat> uh, got us to crochet to keep the peace in the back seat. So oh, we no. crocheted oh, all types oh, of stuff no. on long trips. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, yes. So. I, I've done a lot of crocheting. I've crocheted a lot just to keep oh. out of trouble. So, Subdeacon and Daniel, to see what you started. <laughs> hey, you're not the only crocheter. I've done that. Oh, yeah, too. Father Elias. <laughs> yeah, Who else is a I've crocheter? I crochet right, too. There you go. Yeah, the well. lost art of crochet. And the crocheted owl that you frame and put on the wall, you know, <laughs> in browns and oranges. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. <laughs> Mark, it's yours. I, I, I know I have to uh, push you a little bit to get you to, uh, uh, to share a few things, if you don't mind. Whatever you want to say. Funny, hilarious. Uh, Can't think of anything funny, but... Um, uh, sad. <laughs> you mentioned COVID, and um, that's been a big pain in everybody's backside recently, but uh, I've been at the parish I'm at now since the mid nineties. And I started serving in the, at the altar a couple of years after I showed up. And there was this one guy uh, that's been here the whole time. He goes to the early service and I never knew his name. And now I've been rector here for 20 years and I still didn't know his name. And it wasn't until one of the things Oregon asked us to do is when they first took off the mask mandate, which is back again, right, um, was to check people's vaccination cards. So if they had your vaccination card, then you could take your mask off. And we didn't insist on that, but we got a lot of people that volunteered to show us their card anyways. And one of the guys was this mystery man that I've been trying to figure out who he was for 20 years. And now I finally know his name. It's I don't have to greet him every Sunday as hi. Hi. <laughs> so that's my story on that. Very good. Now, what, what church are you at, Father? Uh, St. Mark's, Portland. Okay. Yeah, I've heard your name. Have you been involved with A-House for a few years? I uh, started last year, yeah. Okay, maybe it was just, I thought it was in the last few years, but okay, very good, very good. Uh, how many of you are married? 
Raise your hand. And uh, uh, how many kids do you have? Two, three, three. Um, I've, I have two. And how many, grand, how many grandkids do you have? And, and somebody has a dog too. I, okay, I have one grandchild, uh, a boy, uh, 13 years old, just be, uh, turned 13. So, um, the love of my life. Uh, what is the, uh, how many of you are carpenters? None? Four. Oh. I've, built, I've built something made of wood, but that doesn't make me a carpenter. Oh, no. Okay. Anybody likes working with wood? I, um, I've worked a lot with my grandfather and my father, and my grandfather was a carpenter. I wouldn't consider myself a carpenter, but I have helped in building a house and some sheds and, you know, a lot of different structures like that. But I still wouldn't call myself a, a carpenter. Okay, it's, it's a question of name. That's not a problem, but uh, at least you enjoy doing it. That's good. good. Um, how was your week going? As uh, a student at the A House. What is it, uh, the thing that you've learned m the most? Or a light, uh, an eye-opening thing for you? For me, the real eye-opening thing was um, learning really, at least uh, I think this is the reason is why uh, deaconesses went away. Uh, that kind of blew me away about the, the need in the early church where people were always baptized naked and so there is why you needed a deaconess to 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 do that type of uh, of work, uh, you know, because of propriety and stuff. And then, of course, as the church developed over the years, uh, you know, it went more into the infant baptism and stuff, and there wasn't quite the need. So I thought that was really kind of interesting as to why that kind of went out of use in favor of having a deaconess, or or one of the reasons, anyway. Anybody else? A moment of aha of something, maybe a small idea, a small thought. Uh, uh. I was greatly encouraged with the, and this was new to me, the mystery of the brother is, oh. I think it was by St. Ambrose. Uh, I think it was St. Ambrose. I, I don't remember. I, I have to go back. It was just in the last session, but Father Quadi shared with the, it's essentially being our neighbor is the second altar, loving them and, and giving all we have for the care of our neighbor. And he showed the icon of uh, Christ, but as <clears throat> Samaritan helping the man who was wounded and providing for him. But I thought that was a very, uh, I don't know that the <laughs> concept was so new, but the way that it was explained was very uh, not just inspirational, but I guess enlightening at the same time. I feel like I learned something, even though like the head knowledge part of it didn't necessarily seem new, but uh, perhaps my heart was learning something as he was explaining that. And I found it wonderfully encouraging. That's good. Anybody else? I've, been, I've enjoyed studying Greek. Uh, I've, I've been messing around with Greek for a while and, and with Kiriaki, you know, Sunday, and then now Father Michelle. It's, it's just been nice to, to kind of reaffirm what I've done, and that is read the first chapter over and over and over again for about a year. And uh, but I was surprised at how much uh, Greek uh, Father Michelle knows, too. So that it's been kind of fun being a student for a while. Anybody else? I just, uh, I think for me, what I've discovered, I think, in these two residencies that I've been uh, associated with, both of them virtually, um, I can see how much we're missing out on because I'm enjoying so much even in the Zoom. I can only imagine 
how much more uh, there is when you're actually sitting in a classroom together and spending time afterwards fellowshipping together that we're missing out on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, Subdeacon, who here has not been to a, a residency yet uh, at the Antiochian Village? You guys? Probably you know, none of us. Okay. Uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, Father Mark, uh, is it Father Mark? Is that right? Um, I the... Probably not. <laughs> what, what is, uh, are you a deacon or a presbyter? Or? Uh, what, uh, he is in the process of coming into the Orthodox faith. Yeah. Okay. Transitional period. Well, if he's a father I mean, in the Episcopal Church or Lutheran or whatever, he still uh, we still can call him father. But you know, it's uh, uh, somehow I've just seen your name, and maybe there's another name, someone else named with that same last name. But yeah, the uh, the residencies are kind of neat um, because you know it's like a breath of fresh air. I one of our our chanters at our church. Who grew up in the church in in Pennsylvania? He went as a uh, a, a kid to the Antiochian village to the uh, camp, and he said it was life changing because for once in his life, everybody was Orthodox. That was kind of the default faith, and the whole world was Orthodox. And, and attention left him, and he just thought this is so amazing, and it was just life changing. You know, and in a way, and of course, we're adults now and, and we're less affected by life changing moments, you might say. But still, it's it's wonderful for all of us to get together. And and even though we come from different places in every which way you can imagine, uh, the one common faith and those even coming into the faith, it, it just feels good. It's 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 nice. It's amazing. And when we have those uh, services in um uh, what is the chapel there? St. Peter and Paul, Ignatius. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the chapel, it just, the, 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 uh, the, we raise the rafters with our singing and, and it just feels so good. Like you're a kid again at, at camp or something. So you'll love it. I, I hope with all my heart that we have it next year, next fall. Yeah, I got a question along that line for like, when you do like St. Stephen's course and you graduate, so you'd come to the residency for the, uh, for us, it'd be the third one. Uh, would it be uh, for the whole week or do you just come for the, for the day of the graduation? Uh, graduation typically uh, takes place on Thursday. So you're not required to come out for the whole week because obviously right. it's expensive. It costs you money and accommodation and what have you. But if you only show up for one day, uh, that's all what is expected of you to, to make to make sure you're able to attend the graduation. Now, some choose to to stay longer uh, and be part of uh, maybe a whole week, and then certainly they're welcome to do that one. You know, I'm I'm speaking out of turn here, and I know we're being recorded, um, but maybe because of the extraordinary two years with the COVID thing and, and not having, um, uh, you know, not having the, the, the residency there at the village. I wonder if maybe we will invite people to come the whole week who, who haven't had that opportunity, you know, but we'll see, we'll see what Father Michelle, you know, I'm not suggesting anything. Oh, I am really. <laughs> we'll see what Father <laughs> Michelle might come up with because uh, it would be wonderful because Nobody should go through the St. Stephen's course without having at least a week there. It doesn't seem to me. So anyway, I got his, I got his ear. I just texted him and, uh, and we'll, maybe I'll bring that up with him. So, and it does cost money, but it's, it's nice. It's very nice. Uh, let me ask um, everyone. Uh, I want you to put a hat on of running the show uh, this evening. So uh, we'll start with uh, Subdeacon Daniel. And uh, you, you pose a question you want to ask the rest of us. And we, everyone takes turn. We'll answer you and we'll answer everybody. How about that, Deacon? Deacon Simeon? Yeah, yeah. And nothing's off base, you know, no matter how, uh, what it is. It, we'll see if people answer. So whatever's on your heart, really, the deepest thing on your heart, or 
something trivial. Ask us. Yeah. So, and it doesn't matter if it's from this residency or last, but what's been uh, everybody's favorite uh, professor in class so far? And then I'll give my answer at the end. We'll start with you, Subdeacon David, since I'm the teacher right now. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I would say that I have two that are really, really close. Uh, so I'm going to kind of say both. <laughs> but it's I've got the most out uh, uh, on the spiritual side of things and really assimilating it more into the life is from Father Fadi. And uh, I just have that I found all of his classes very transformational. I've loved all the classes, but uh, the way that he ties them in really by not allowing us to just let it be mental, uh, a mental exercise that we go through, uh, he just doesn't allow any wiggle room for that. So I would say that has to be my uh, my favorite classes to attend. I but as far as read the readings that were that we've had to do, I would say uh, the scripture class, I think Old Testament so far, I've really enjoyed the readings of, we had so many diverse things we had to read from, uh, even from the Syrian and uh, what the, from the Zohar, <laughs> from the second temple Judaism, just tying all of those things together was very, in, it was very interesting because I've read the Old Testament my whole life, but to see these things tied in, uh, it was very transformational too. So in attendance, it's Father Fadi for the reading assignments. It's been. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pastor Mark. <clears throat> well, Father Fadi is definitely the most entertaining to watch um, and attend. Um, and there's no insincerity in him whatsoever. Um, but because my undergrad is in history, I have to go with Father Michelle on uh, with the history course because um, that was just brought so many pieces that if you have a more Western background, uh, you just don't get. You don't realize how much of what the West says is the church is actually um, settled by the East. It wasn't, I don't want to knock my um, <clears throat> European forebearers, but basically we were savages most of the time. Uh, and while the East was actually eating with knives and forks. So um, I like the history class a lot. A subdeacon Ignatius. Oh boy, that's a tough one for me. Um, I got, well, I got two that are kind of tied uh father michelle uh, uh, absolutely uh, wonderful uh listening to him and and um just, like say the whole way they put the, the the structure of it and learning um you know about like the, the rums for the romans and that type of stuff and then also don't, uh, uh, ignatius the word room 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 like yeah. it like your bedroom room right room. i thought that was just yeah. just so much of what he had to teach was just so amazing to me and gave me such insight and the other person would be uh, uh father patrick o'grady and, and a lot of that for me is is uh is being western right and uh sometimes it's still kind of difficult for me to feel for really accepted and i i know we are but uh it's just kind of that that touching in there which i thought was really good that he did kind of touch on that uh especially when we're coming into mountains and stuff like that uh or the whole sanctification of time we're getting ready to learn so yeah both really good and then as far as uh uh a person uh, I, I so I, I can't really pick out that's fake because father body comes up so much as far as here's this guy with two you know doctorates degrees and all that and it's just like such a great example or three yeah right and it's just like but it's it's all transformed into inside him and it comes out as you know christ and as his love as christ's love for us and and there's just so much of that that i this guy got so much brilliance in, in his mind and yet all this comes out just so loving and caring 
and uh, saying, yes, this is all true, but you know, you got to see the bigger picture. And I, so I just love that too, as far as the entertainment and really um, making you just feel the love of, of the orthodoxy and how it is a whole way of life and not just, you know, doing church. Thank you. Now, Deacon Philip. Uh, I think it would be patristics. Um, when, when Father Michel says the word, the fathers, he says it in a very different way, a very different feeling than every other person I've heard that word. We, at, in our parish, someone will, you know, cite the fathers, and they're being, they're being trivial. They're being um, argumentative. They're trying to find proof texts. But when he says the fathers, I I, I can just sense this uh, immense honor, respect, at uh, admiration of them. And then in class today, uh, excuse me, yesterday. And he said that the apostolic fathers, I, this is not his, ex, uh, he did, uh, this is my paraphrase, but he, he said that the apostolic fathers had the same level of inspiration as the apostles and the prophets. I was just blown away. I mean, like he, he like the, uh, it's just a, such a deeper, Uh, honor given to them than anything I've ever met in my life. And I'm like so uh, e eager to learn more about them. Uh, you know, that sounds so academic. I am so eager to be transformed as I read what they said. Thank you, Sub Deacon Philip. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. You're still on mute. Unmute yourself. Yes, hello everyone. Hello, Abuna. Hello, hello. Hello. Sorry, I just got to finish my job, so I got on my car. So, yeah, I'm listening to you. I come in the, uh, in the middle of the meeting. So, uh, I'm happy to hear everyone, actually. But uh, can you please give me, uh, ask the question one more time? Sir, if you could tell us uh, what, uh, what has your favorite residency class been uh, since you've been in the program? Um, I can't. I came to the village last last year. So uh, last year, a couple of years ago. So I uh, it was great to meet the doctors. I want to say the fathers and the doctors. You know, uh, it was honor for me to meet Father Antipas and. It was great to, to hear to, to her uh, uh, course, I want to say. Uh, and also, I learned a lot from Father Michel. Actually, I like the history. The history is one of the best of uh, my subjects. So, yeah, uh, it's learned me a lot. A lot. That was my voice, Abuna. Um, it's clear. Uh, not now. I I I stopped hearing you. Maybe the others as well. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe maybe you're getting into a, a low coverage area or something. Uh, stay. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, what we're doing okay. here, we're, we're letting everybody take a chance on uh, running the show, so to speak. 
and then everybody will have a chance to ask their questions of the others. So uh, let's move on. I think we uh, we got everybody. Uh, Subdeacon David, if you want to, do you want to go ahead and uh, and be the moderator for a second? Certainly. I what I what I'd like to ask is what has either been the most either the most challenging class or the biggest challenge to completing things because we all have life and jobs and whatnot. So whether it's the classwork itself or just whatever the challenge, whatever comes to mind when challenged to complete the work or embrace the work. I'll jump right in there. The hardest one for me was uh, scripture last year. I mean, I loved it. I loved all the reading, but here is your final now, you know, write all these things and then you didn't know what was going on. And uh, so that was, yeah, definitely challenging, uh, especially just, just writing and kind of trying to figure out how to, you know, just do it and uh, stuff. So that was, uh, you know, scripture was like overwhelmingly illuminating and transformative and yet so hard. It's, in fact, the whole course, a lot of that for me was almost catechizing and illuminating. I'm getting all caught up in all the stuff I learned. Says, okay, dude, now you got to bring it back down to earth and put it under, <laughs> into paper. And I was like, ah! That's it. I have to admit, I felt the exact same way. Um, it, you know, you go through the, all the readings and all this preparation, and it's like, okay, write five papers and data dump. And by the way, we'll let you know in the middle of June if you pass them. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> um, it, as opposed to getting a little bit of feedback from each right. paper and knowing if I'm left to center or right to center or right on, right on the mark. Uh, and I think the other thing I missed in that class um, was that uh, Father Bogdan didn't have uh, Zoom sessions along the way like some of the other uh, professors had done. And I think personally, I think we missed we missed out on on uh, some some great interaction because I've watched some YouTube videos of Father Bogdan talk about different things, and he's. He's actually an amazing man to listen to speak. Um, and so if you have the opportunity uh, outside of class, uh, I've, I'm actually, a, because I've liked a few of his YouTube websites, um, gotten notifications of when he's speaking again. And uh, had I not been uh, in another class uh, about a month ago, I would have attended, he, he gave another talk. Uh, so that was for me probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, in my mind, I call him a 4D theologian because he's so, it's so incredible the way, where his mind goes. Uh, Subdeacon Philip, let's head over to you. I have incredible anxiety surrounding education. This is my, my uh, fourth attempt to go to graduate school. I tried the St. Stephen's course uh, five years ago and dropped out after a year. So my challenge is when I'm asked to write, write something, I am seized with anxiety. So I am, I love the reading. I love listening to the lectures, but the biggest thing is writing. And uh, yeah. Subdeacon Philip, you know, be comforted that uh, so many people have taken their first St. Stephen's course uh, and then and then not dropped out, but basically put it on hold for years, including yours truly here. So uh, to, to get back into the mill of uh, academia is daunting. And unless you're just an academic animal, uh, you know, we're all with you. We're, we totally understand. So you're right there where you should be. In fact, if it didn't bother you, if you're utterly confident uh, in all of this, we would hate you. I, I, uh, I, I feel a level of sadness that I, uh, uh, when I, when I did, took the program, you know, five years ago, it was very, very different. There were no, no live lectures, uh, no, no populi, and uh, I, I would, I'm. I'm glad that Subdeacon Daniel said that I can find Father Bogdan on uh, YouTube because I'd like to, I, 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 
I wish I could have taken his Old Testament course, but I had already taken Old Testament under the old system. And so uh, maybe I'll look, look to see if I can find him on YouTube. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> uh, the subdeacon Philip, yes, if sir. you need some help, uh, let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll find a way to, um, to find whatever is necessary to, uh, to be there for you. Okay, thank you. Subdeacon David, again, it's all yours. And then uh, let's head over to Father Mark. Well, uh, I think like everybody else, the, the Old Testament um, was a struggle. I got behind in the reading because I was paying attention to other things and trying to work your way through a whole lot of readings and write five papers. Um, I don't know. I was really ready to go. Well, I don't think I really want to do this, <laughs> but I made it through. Um, I have, um, I'm actually, actually dyslexic, which uh, my public school did not figure out about until, well, they never did figure it out. Actually, I dropped out of high school when I decided that it really wasn't worth my while and um, didn't actually get a, someone to really teach me to read until I was in my mid 20s. And that's when I want to start at a college again. Well, not again, college. Um, so I, you know, that's like Subdeacon Philip. That's a big, always a big worry. But uh, I got to admit, though, um, Father O'Grady's uh, liturgics class last fall, um, that was a struggle as well because. I've never been to a Byzantine service. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that out loud here in the Byzantines, but anyways, um, I've never been to one. So he would describe things and I'd say, oh, that sounds extremely interesting, but I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, so um, that was a little struggle to try to get through the, the divine liturgy part of that. And um, some of it, you know, once you see it, a little more, you can start to say, well, okay, I can see where that fits with what, what we do here in the West, but other parts of it don't, we go in different directions. So um, that, that was a tough one as well. But that's where you learn in the tough ones. Uh, Ibrahim, if you can hear us, it what has been your biggest challenge in class so far, or any of the classes? Uh, actually, it was uh, um, the terminology, I want to say, the terminology from the world, I want to say, because my background is Arabic. So I'm trying to, it's hard to, to you know, it's hard to me to, to know all kinds of the, ter the theology terminology. So it was hard for me. It's, took a lot of time for me to know all the world so uh but i'm still trying i'm still trying on all the courses so yeah uh yeah this is what uh, this is my challenge actually Rahim, where, where are you at where are you at what 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 city do you live in I'm living in uh, California, and the city is called Temecula. Who's your Teme priest? Yes, I'm. I'm serving with Father Hanania Hakimi. I know Father Hanania. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, to, uh, Mark, are, you're you're leading the show, my friend. Oh, great. Um, <clears throat> well, torture us. Anything you want to torture us with, go for it. That's one thing that I keep thinking about because, you know, I fell away from the church when I was uh, in my teens, uh, like a number of you. I think of the person that that kind of set the set the seed 
And that was, for me, that was my grandmother. She was a feisty little Methodist woman um, who um, thought if you were sitting down, you weren't working, so you needed to get some, get up and do something useful. <laughs> um, but uh, she, she was the one that was all she, you know, really faithful in her, in her church attendance and in the work she did for the church. And, um, and although I didn't appreciate her at the time, because she used to try to get me to get up on a Sunday morning. Um, but um, I mean, I guess my question is, who's, who set the seed for you? Uh, I, like you, uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was the, the spiritual guide. Perhaps I'm here because of her. That very good question. Thank you. Thank you. So those that were in the the meet and greet on Tuesday heard my story, kind of how my path. Um, but it comes down to about the same thing. Uh, my grandmother, uh, who raised actually a Roman Catholic priest, uh, and after I got married. Uh, told my wife and I, you know, you guys need to figure this out because doing nothing isn't the answer. You need to, you have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, she honestly, she told us, she goes, I don't care where you go or what you call it, but you need to find something. And that was the beginning. That's what, that was the seed. Uh, not that I never had it, not that I didn't live in it because I, I grew up in it as a child. But again, as a young adult, I fell away and uh, she, she didn't drag us to it. She just matter of factly just said, this is, you need to do something and you know it, you knew it and we both knew it in our hearts. And she just watered that seed and, and helped us grow. And blessed memory. Mm -hmm. What's up, Deacon David? I'd say uh, a few people, my grandparents and uh, and my parents, I would say uh, we grew up, I grew up uh, brethren or so in slash Southern Baptist was their backgrounds, but mostly in the, the Protestant evangelical non-denomination, as they call it, of <laughs> the brethren. And uh, what my parents and grandparents really encouraged and really resonated with me was really staying in the scriptures and not just in the Sola Scriptura way, but actually kind of praying through it and uh, making sure that we would spend as much time, whether it was in prayer or scripture, as we did doing, if you're reading fictional books or doing this or that, make sure you're studying and trying to grapple through what's happening to instill it. So that was huge. And then uh, some, a huge use of my parents further is that uh, I have seven siblings, five of which were adopted. So just the, all of the stuff that went with adopt, and I'm the oldest, so all of the things that went with adopting kids, many of them special needs, was very, very powerful to see um, because we had to also embrace all of that, but it was it was very powerful in my journey because we had to actually learn to live out some of the things and watching my parents do that is a big reason why. Anyone else want to answer that? You know, um, with me, it, it, it's so many. In one sense, it's kind of my grandparents. We, we would have a large family reunion every three years. and We would read from the Psalms about um, we kind of are a people or a family who passed down the faith from generation to generation. So I feel like I'm a part of a legacy of those who have sought God and have been faithful 
uh, trying to be faithful. Uh, but I guess I think of another guy uh, when I was 16 in high school, and Mike Simonson, who was, uh, I went to a Bible study. He had a beard and a big guy, and he was preaching you know, with a Bible in his hand, and he was preaching as if it were true and as if it were speaking for today, and it just blew me away. And ever since that night, and I kept going to his Bible study, I was a changed person and uh, kind of set a trajectory for me. And if I had to <clears throat> add a few more people with the brethren, uh, Jim Elliott was the kind of a hero of mine, as well as Francis Schaefer. And, and they seem to be at the two ends of the, the poles uh, there where you have one abandoning the world and the other trying to embrace it and claim it in some way. And so that's always been the uh, polarity in my life, what to do. And then, uh, you know, came into orthodoxy maybe 28 years ago, but that's kind of my, uh, my lineage. I'll, I'll go. Um, it would be hard for me to place uh, a name. I, I was raised in a, a Baptist, a very devout Baptist home. Um, it's funny, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, although I was raised in a very pious Baptist home, I didn't feel very much uh, inspiration from them, from my, from my parents. But I pursued the faith on my own, and uh, it's hard for me to place inspiration for. I never fell away from the faith, but I have to say that uh, eventually I left the Baptist church and I started going to a non-denominational church. And one time we had a guest speaker. He was a uh, recent. This was when I was in high school you know, 30, uh, 30 years ago, the, we had a guest speaker who was uh, someone who had just finished, finished seminary and uh, assemblies of God. And he came and he spoke on the Didache or the, the teaching of the 12. And I was just blown away by it. And that, that planted the seed. I was like, there are these things called the fathers and and there's these ancient writings and it just, it just, uh, it captivated me. In university, I wrote two papers on, uh, on the shepherd of Hermas. I, and, and all this, I never heard about the Orthodox church. I mean, it wasn't until 20 years after that, when I was in China, where I ran across Orthodoxy. And so, but I, I, I just remember that, that guest speaker that one Sunday talking about um, the, the, the Didache and, and Eucharist uh, in our non-denominational church. And that, that was a, a, that planted a seed, that planted a, a seed very much. Okay, well, uh, well, uh, Ibrahim, you want to answer uh, that question? What was the most influential thing in your life? In your faith? And please unmute yourself. Ibrahim? Yes, Abuna. Yes, Father. Uh, did you hear the question? Yes, Abuna. Uh, Can you answer that? Um, when I start to serving in the altar, I want to say that's it was the the great things that happened to me. You know, I I never thinking in all my life I want to I can serve uh, on the altar when it's happened the last the first time. It was great for me actually. Uh, 
and starting like 2018. And that's the first time. Ibrahim, is your last name Jarouj? Yes, sir. Oh, you're the one. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm the one, Abuna. Okay, nice to meet you. Okay. Thank you, Abuna. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Sabdik and Philip, the, uh, the moderation is yours. It's all yours. That's your show now. We've, uh, thank we've, got, you. we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I guess I'd like uh, everyone to share. I mean, it's probably, it probably intersects with what you've already shared in some degree, but was there a, a specific, I, I guess this question assumes that uh, you're a convert like I am. So if, if, if you're not, then you can adapt it as, as, as necessary. But was there a specific aspect of the Orthodox Church that was the initial hook that then dragged you into it and then you uh, were captivated by it more later? Like, what was that initial hook? I'll share for myself. As, a, as an evangelical, I knew I was supposed to pray, but I just had no idea how to pray. And I could read the Bible, but all I could do was feel guilt about not praying because I just, I just had no idea how to pray. And when I discovered that there were written prayers, it just it was like, oh my gosh, this is what I need. I, I, this makes it so easy. I, I can actually pray now and not just feel guilty that I'm not praying. And I, 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 you might say I, I found written prayers and I pursued, I, I, I pursued it to its source and was so happy what I found. So for, for anyone else, was there a specific hook that uh, drew you? Um, I'll start with um, Subdeacon Dan, Sub Daniel. So Again, I, I grew up in the church, but I didn't grow up in the Orthodox Church. And when we did, actually, I, again, I told my story. We were on a, literally, going in the phone book and chasing churches just to find something. Uh, because we truly were lost. Uh, we needed something in our life. We were looking for where we finally landed. And... Um, Again, when we first walked into St. Thomas and Fairlawn and just the presence of being in God's house, we truly felt it. You truly felt that we were being wrapped with his loving arms, bringing us home. Um, it felt like for the first time. And uh, the people of the church added to that. But it was just being there and feeling his presence, big H, his presence in that building. Um, it, we, we've been there for 20 plus years now. We made our conversion there. We, we accepted every challenge that's come our way since, but it was, that's what it was for us. Thank you, Subdeacon Daniel. Um, Father Mark? Well, it's it's long road, and I'm looking forward to being home finally. But um, the it's an it's an I grew up like I said I grew up a Methodist. I became a Lutheran for a couple of years, then became came to um, continuing Anglicanism, uh, as it's called, um, which uh, is. I was going to say it was falling apart, but I don't think it was ever really together. Um, but, and it's weighed on my mind being the pastor here for now over 20 years, what to do? Should I let a parish that's 130 some years old simply die? Because that's, that's the path we're on, uh, right? You know, and, continuing Anglicanism. 
And it's a, this is my weird story. I was had a, a, some time off um, and it was house sitting for my, my brother and his, his wife. I was taking care of their goat and cat. Um, and I was wasting some time in the afternoon because it was, it was raining and I didn't want to go outside and do anything. Um, and I was watched a view, view, uh, YouTube video and for probably because my sister-in-law was um, watches a bunch of stuff with music in it. A video flipped up next, which was a Ukrainian church's Christmas hymn, um, which was beautiful. Now, I have no idea what they were saying because I do not know anything about church Slavonic or Ukrainian or whatever they were singing it. Um, but I started crying because it was just so beautiful. And the beauty of it is there, the tradition. And if there's the, the thing that draws me to orthodoxy is unapologetic tradition. Anglicans are constantly apologizing for having anything traditional. Um, and they really don't know what that is other than we've always done it that way, which means you've done it that way for three years. Um, <laughs> but orthodoxy has real tradition. It goes all the way back. And whatever they were, well, they were singing the, the hymn that's a lullaby, but also was talking about the crucifixion I found out later, which is probably why I started crying. But anyway, um, the, that deep depth of spiritual faith and tradition, that's, that's what draws me. That, that's what I am looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Father Mark. Uh, Father Deacon Simeon? Yeah. Okay. So, what what most drew us to the Orthodox faith is that the question? Or 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 the initial hook, or maybe not. Yeah. Maybe the initial uh, initial. Okay. The, the very initial hook. The very initial hook. I was. Uh, I was. I, I guess you would say a, a an evangelical in a large, <coughs> you know, church, suburban church, and um, uh, me and some of my friends were going down to Florida, uh, to. A beach vacation just me and a bunch of you know good christian guys and and i asked the question it just dawned on me um you know, how do we know the bible's true you know not that i was i was even doubting i just thought okay if somebody were to ask me why is it christian to believe in the bible not even that the bible's true but why is it even christian to believe in the bible how did that come to be a part of our faith uh and and that was the the very pointy end of the wedge, and then later issues of interpretation. But I remember asking the uh, my my friends, and they were all so annoyed at me, and uh, you know created uh, you know, great arguments and philosophizing and all this stuff for our beach vacation. But uh, it was it was the pointy end. Just wondering where did my faith come from again, and uh, ultimately, you know, I looked into Catholicism, and then ultimately. Uh, you know, through a co-worker of my wife, I, I was introduced to Orthodoxy, which set me in another spiral because now there were two churches. <laughs> and, um, um, and and ultimately, you know, through philosophical machinations, you know, I became Orthodox. But that was it. You know, where did we where did we get the Bible and, and how do we interpret it? I'm sure that's that's common for many people. Thank, thank you, Father Deacon Simeon. Uh, Subdeacon David. Um, it's a host of things, but I would say what really got me interested most in orthodoxy was uh, trying to really learn how to pray. I was a Protestant pastor, evangelical for about seven or eight years, and through that time when I would talk with, I was an associate pastor and then a brief time as a senior pastor at a place, but most of the time I'd be talking with other pastors and they would tell me they don't really know how to pray. They hardly even understand the reason for prayer and, or even worship in general. It's sort of like 
it's an add-on, but the real thing is just do studying so that you can preach a sermon. And I, uh, how do I put, I, Christ commands us to pray, obviously, and I knew there was something there. And, and in some way, reading about some of the American revivals that now I don't look on in the same way, but at the time I was like, oh, these people really were praying. I want to learn how to pray. And I just kept going further and further back. And I would, I kept stumbling into writings of monks or writings of monastic communities from the Eastern church or Eastern fathers talking about prayer. And mm -hmm. uh, there was basically nothing in the evangelical world that I could find really about prayer other than someone saying like, how to get a bigger backyard if you say if you if you pray in the right <laughs> formula or <laughs> use this verse if you want to you know get your dream car it's like yeah that's I don't there's just something off but when I would read the eastern writers and see what they're really praying and then I started doing those prayers it was so transformative and it was the first time I'd ever encountered I did not even know there were such things as prayer books until I was probably 25 I mean so I had never even heard of such a thing in the Brethren movement. So it was a, it was, it's been incredibly powerful to enter in and uh, something to experience alone, but then to actually come into a community and say, we're actually praying the same thing. The first time I attended an Orthodox service, that was, uh, so the hook and then also the seeing it in practice that it was actually a common prayer and a method of, uh, what what made me really want to pursue it is I didn't, as I was teaching youth or teaching people and trying to do this, I didn't know how I could teach someone else how to pray. If So if I came to my own way of praying, how could I possibly pass that on? So that was a huge motive for me to just want to find something. How was I going to teach my children how to pray? Just make it up on off of their mind half the stuff that comes out of my mind is so terrible. So why do I want to go off that? So anyway, that was my real, uh, I guess the, the, the cry of my heart to find it and to see it in Orthodoxy was so fulfilling. And um, thank God that the Orthodox church has persevered for so long. Thank you. Thank you, Subdeacon. Subdeacon Ibrahim, uh, what was the initial hook that, uh, that, uh, grabbed you and brought you into orthodoxy. Okay, um, I born I, actually, uh, you know, my my faith was from I born with my family uh, orthodox to be orthodox. Uh, but I learned from uh, I want to say our church. It's mean spiritual. This is what it's what's mean to me. So spirituality everything inside the church it's a spiritual you can uh, uh, you can touch it you can feel it you can uh, your face your faith my faith I'm talking I'm, I'm about my faith it's um, uh, it's every it's coming from the spirituality of the Orthodox so very simple and the uh, spirituality uh, uh, for the church uh, in the church it's teach me to be silent uh, most of the time so this is what i'm learning from 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 it uh, and thanks god to be mm. here thank you uh, other allies what was your hook? The hook uh, having left the Orthodox Church uh, around age 15, and then I was reintroduced into uh, believe, re believing in God through the Protestant uh, uh, teacher of mine. And I had uh, a in a Protestant term, conversion experience at that time. Uh, and then when I became associated with so many different Protestants, 
and everyone was saying they are the New Testament church. And they believe in, in the scripture alone. And that was intriguing, except I created a dilemma for me that all those who claim to be believer in the Holy Scriptures, they're not consistent in their faith based on the Scripture. So either people are wrong or the Scripture gives you different uh, theology. And that I could not accept. Um, so I started looking in my theological studies. I was looking for the New Testament church and, and make sense out of the, uh, the horrible hermeneutics in, in, the con in, in, in the context I was living in. And just like what I shared with you before, um, the last two sessions, I, um, I've said it before, at the doorstep of, of graduation, graduating from a uh, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, I, I found uh, the church that was the New Testament. And to my utter surprise, I was not looking for the Orthodox Church, but it turned out to be the Orthodox Church. And that was where I was baptized in, uh, raised in for at least 15 years, with uh, a great influence of my uh, city. Uh, my grandmother, and uh, uh, and then they reopened the whole new world, and all of a sudden they just say like uh, it's a watershed, and uh, glad to be here, I'm glad to find that faith uh, that was given to all the uh, uh, the apostles and continues to be the same, unchanged with continuity and uh, uh, unchanged um, apostolic succession. And, and uh, I was not looking for those big words at all. all. What I wanted to see, where is the New Testament church? Everybody's talking about it. Um, you know, I it, uh, wasn't thinking in, in terms of uh, profound theologian or anything like that. It was just, find me the New Testament church. Where is that? Where is it? Is it alive? And uh, lo and behold, it was alive, and uh, it wasn't very far from me, from my heart. In my writings, when I was in seminary, everybody was telling me I was writing Eastern Orthodox theologies. So you're kidding, without knowing it, you know. It was so ingrained in my ethos, uh, so it was easy to come out. Since I'm the last one here, the last one to give the uh, to moderate the meeting is Brahim. Brahim, ask any question you want of all of us. It's your turn. Uh, By the way, Brahim, for for some of you that don't know what the name means, it's what everybody knows as Abraham. Abraham. But, uh, Ibrahim. It's the pronunciation of of Abraham in in the Arabic-speaking world. Um, my question, how, how can you let the people know about our Orthodox, our Orthodox Church? Uh, ask any, anyone, who do you want to start with? Abuna, Father. Oh. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I, in my in my view, uh, look here. Do you see on, uh, on the screen? Yes, I will. You have uh, seven evangelists. Uh, okay, Subdeacon David. I have found with uh, my own whether it's my own family or some of my friends, uh, the term Orthodox, many of them thought that I had rejected Christ and became a Jew. <laughs> so uh, they never heard of these, uh, Orthodox Christianity. So it's been a, in that realm, it's been a little bit of a slow process where I'm allowing them to uh, 
ask questions as some of that comes up and um my mom for instance she has she when she saw what the services looked like on the internet and my dad had attended with me once she said never take me to a place like that and so i just never really brought it up with her uh really but i still would talk about uh, God and maybe say something that I learned from a father or something, but try not to, I tried not to be uh, rude about it, but I didn't pretend like I was an Orthodox either. And that, and now she's been messaging me, well, what about, what is this sacrament? And what is that? She's reading out of the Orthodox study Bible and reading about chrismation and wanting to know if that's what we still, it, and it's been really neat. So trying to just live the life as a Christian has really been I guess the, the short answer and uh, not be ashamed of the fact that we have traditions. We have these things that go way back uh, and trying to not be like an arrogant Protestant. Like I was kind of taught to grown up to be and <laughs> to argue with everyone. So not arguing, that might be my way. Thank you. Subdeek and Philip, right. I'm reminded of a, a passage in the New Testament where uh, Paul was talking about a, a believing wife and an unbelieving husband. And he said, uh, uh, I, I, I can't remember the exact, but I, you, you will be able to win, win him to Christ even without words through your good works. And uh, I guess for myself, my family is, I'm the youngest of seven kids, and my family are very uh, indifferent, if not hostile to orthodoxy. And I, I just focus on, I focus on trying to be transformed myself. And I hope that um, as I, as I draw, as I become more Christ-like, it may inspire them to ask questions, but uh, I don't actively, I don't actively tell people about orthodoxy. I have found that to be uh, futile in my context. Uh, right here, oh, you're good. Oh, you, you were uh, muted. Deacon Simon? Yeah, I um, maybe um, falling back to the redoubt here. Uh, so many people keep showing up at our church, and I'm not sure how they get there. You know, I don't know if they watch YouTube videos these days or if they uh, read a book, or I have no idea how people hear about orthodoxy these days. But from where I am, a long time in orthodoxy, um, when they show up just trying to be the best Christian and the best lover of God, the best uh, orthodox that I can um, so that they would want what I've partaken of, I think that would be it. You know, I know that's just not right out there handing out tracts. Um, and I don't say that disparagingly. I mean, praise God, we've all said that our grandmothers our Protestant grandmothers were the ones that brought us the faith or whatever. So let's not disparage those people at all. Uh, but once people come to my church, I always want them to, to love the faith, you know? And, uh, and so I'm on my toes all the time because I'm always talking to people who are brand new, you're brand spanking new, not even necessarily coming into the faith at that point. And so, you know. I've always said that, um, or really we're not the one that bring people to church. Uh, the Holy Spirit does it. And, and just like what uh, Deacon Simeon alluded to, it's really true. I mean, it, it, it happens in my parish. We, are, we get so many people. Um, it's the Holy Spirit working through them. And we're just barely conduit uh, doing the work. And, and all we have to do, just like uh, Subdeacon Phillips said, uh, uh, live by example. Uh, demonstrate 
that faith and make it visible because faith is not a statement it's a living reality and i think when we do that one we we do the work of of the evangelist and just like what i said earlier uh we have seven people here all seven of us are the evangelists for the church in a very minuscule way because though really the the main actor is the holy spirit um in everything that's being done uh, the Holy Spirit brings people in. The Holy Spirit uh, transforms things in the life of those who are inquiring about the faith that they're able to see things. It's really a transfiguration at the same time. Anyway, I, I want to thank you very much for, for sharing your time with us um, on behalf of... Uh, Deacon Simeon and I, uh, we're so grateful that you can be part of this one. And uh, I want to invite you to be part of the the one that we're going to do on monthly, uh, uh, God willing, on monthly uh, ba basis. Um, so we can uh, we can really fortify each other and, and find a, a platform for all the students to, to be engaged with the learning, engaged with the with knowing each other. Because really, this is a significant part of the the education that uh, everyone receives from the Antiochian House of Study. Uh, God willing, we're we're going through a lot of changes, uh, experiencing a lot of challenges, uh, and we're not perfect on many things. And uh, but we're trying on in many different areas to to improve and make it the best place for for the students to uh, gleam and receive uh, solid, uh, rigorous education and a spiritual formation. But uh, uh, last word I want to say to you, never forget your relationship with your spiritual father. If you don't have one, make sure you have one. And it's not someone that you, you say, oh, this is my priest, or he is my confessor. Spiritual father more than a confessor. And uh, uh, at the school, we can't give you that one, but at least we put enough emphasis on that, that you make sure you maintain and ascertain a spiritual father and maintain this uh, relationship with uh, ongoing relationship with your spiritual father. I thank you so, so very much for, for being part of this. And um, I, I am really humbled by by all your stories, all your contributions, and uh, and uh, uh, encourage you to keep sharing it and be engaged with with one another. Uh, attend those uh, those sessions what uh, we're planning on having once a month, and um, um, that's it. And um, uh, this will be made available for anybody that wants to watch this. Um, uh, the session, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be beneficial for for everyone, um, those who's been part of this, and those who who will eventually um, at watch it online. Uh, the reminder: if you if you have a spiritual journey and story, and you want to share it uh, with us, if you if you're willing and you like to write, uh, write as much as you can. And uh, eventually, I'll let you know uh, where to post it. We'll, we're going to create a place on Populi so students can, can log in and, and turn the stories in. And eventually, we'll, we'll put them all together. It will be the story of the Antiochian House of Study. And well, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Okay. So anyway, uh, again, may, may God's peace be with you. And... Uh, uh, the Holy Fathers continue to bless you with all uh, with all your endeavors. Uh, in Christ's name, Amen. Thank you, Abona. Thank you. Let me uh, shut it down.